Um, so Paco got his PhD in 1995, also from the University of Cantabria. He was a postdoc at Oxford and um, returned to the University of Cantabria, where he's currently a full professor. Um, he's received many awards for his work in geometric combinatorics, including being an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians, a Humboldt professorship, an Einstein professorship, the Fulkerson Prize. Um, he has published many papers in geometric combinatorics, um, especially related to problems in polyhedral geometry. And I think among the many things he's done, he's very well known as the constructor of amazing counterexamples. Um, <laughs> um, in particular, um, he uh, published the, the first counterexamples, uh, the first examples of um, point configurations that have disconnected triangulation spaces, the first examples of um, toric hilbert schemes that are disconnected, and what he's going to tell us about today, the first uh, counterexamples to the Hirsch conjecture. Ah. Thank you, Seth. Um, and let me thank you for the uh, University of North Carolina State and Patricia and the invitation. And let me thank you all for being here. Um, as Seth said, the main part of this talk is going to be about these kind of examples to the Hirsch conjecture that I found in 2012. Um, and around it, well, there's going to be quite a lot of motivation and remarks about the Hirsch conjecture before coming to the kind of examples. And at the end, um, I'm going to speak about a little about some attempts of generalization or, um, yeah attempts to prove something close to the Hirsch conjecture. So let me start uh, plainly by telling you what the Hirsch conjecture is or was. Uh, the Hirsch conjecture is a conjecture that if you have a polyhedron with n facets and dimension d, its diameter cannot be higher than n minus d. So let me ask how many of you know what these three words, polyhedron, facets, and dimension mean. Well, dimension, I guess, it's easy. Um, please raise your hand if you don't know what a polyhedron is. Please raise your hand if you don't know what a facet of a polyhedron is. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't worry, I'm going to explain it, but I, I just wanted to know more or less how this is with these, with these objects. Anyway, facets is, so if you think of a three-dimensional polyhedron, like uh, cube of the cathedral of cathedral, facets are going to be what we normally call faces. So, for example, the cathedral has 12 uh, faces, 12 pentagons, and it has dimension 3. So, n minus d is 9, and diameter means the diameter in the graph. So, the polyhedron has a graph that joins vertices through edges. And, well, in the cathedral, for example, the diameter of the graph is 5, meaning that you may need 5 steps to go from a vertex to another one. And with five steps, you can go through any, uh, between any two vertices. So here's a table of some um, polyhedra you're all familiar with, together with the number of facets, dimension, n minus d, and diameter. <coughs> and we see that in all cases, this inequality is satisfied. And actually, in most cases, this, this inequality is, is uh, satisfied uh, with some, with some um, uh, it's lackness, right? Uh, except, for example, in the cube. In the cube, we have <coughs> two d. In the cube of dimension d, we have exactly two d facets, um, so that n minus d is d, and the diameter is also d because you, you need one step along each coordinate direction in order to go from a vertex to the opposite. So, so the d-dimensional cube would be an example of the polytope where this of the polyhedron. Sorry, I didn't define polytope yet. Of a polyhedron where this bound is, is met, but it is also tight. And yeah, and the question that he shot, or the conjecture that he made, is uh, that this is uh, that no polyhedron uh, violates this inequality. Okay. So, um, by a polyhedron, a convex polyhedron, I mean the intersection of a finitely a finite family of fine half spaces. Um, I will use the word polytope very often, and a polytope is just a bounded polyhedron. So in geometric combinatorics, we, we allow for our polyhedron. 
got to be unbounded and they they appear in linear programming, for example. Um, and we have a specific word for bounded ones. Okay, the dimension of a polydot for polyhedron is the dimension of the affine half of it. Um, and this is just to give you a hint that, that yes, um, polydot theory or studying polyhedra is something that mathematicians have been doing for more than 3,000 years, I would say. Uh, for example, well, these pictures, it says, uh, 4th century A, uh, AD, but actually um, that's, that's, the, that's the time when Papus left. But of course, Plato is much older than that. And also these pictures are not that old. These pictures are only 300 years old. They come from one of Kepler's uh, books. And these pictures also come from Kepler's books. And what they represent? Well, they both represent two models of the universe, in a, in a sense, based on polytopes, which I find quite, quite surprising that both the Greeks and Kepler had these models based on regular polytopes. This is, this is how the, Greek, uh, the Greeks philosophers, and in particular Plato, uh, may associate the, the, the four elements plus the ether of the universe to the five uh, regular three-dimensional polyhedra. And this is a, one of the first models of the solar system that Kepler did, in which he thought that the rate, ratio between the distances uh, from the sun to the different planets was exactly governed by how different regular polyhedra fit into one another. Okay, so yeah, people have been interested in polytopes uh, since long for various reasons. Uh, and now, this is, this is a bit more recent, we're interested in the combinatorics of polytopes. Combinatorics meaning how many faces they have, how many vertices they have, how these things relate to one another, and so on. Uh, the first result that we have in this direction is Euler's formula that says that for a three-dimensional polytope, bounded polyhedron, the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces equals two. And using these numbers for the number of faces of a given dimension. I'm going to call vertices, edges, and all these things faces. Vertices are going to be zero dimensional faces, and so on. And as most of you probably know, this, this formula has a realization to arbitrary dimension, and it, and it actually has a lot of uh, um, meaning in topology. Um, now, um, for three dimensional polytos, we know more or less everything. We can, we can characterize the graphs, we know. Uh, but if we go just one dimension higher, there's some, uh, there's some basic questions that we don't know the answer of. And this is just an example of that. In case you, you get bored, you can spend the rest of this colloquium thinking about this question. Can you construct a four-dimensional polytope whose f vector, whose vector of faces of different dimensions, satisfies this inequality? The number of one-dimensional plus two-dimensional faces is greater than 10 times the zero-dimensional plus uh, three-dimensional. Um, this is a part, of, a part of, of the fact that this is an open question. This inequality um, illustrates a big difference between three dimensions and two dimensions, uh, or between, yeah, I guess between three dimensions and four dimensions. In three dimensions, we have Euler's, inequality, Euler's, Euler's equation, and Euler's equation has the implication that, for example, f1 is going to be bigger than f0 and bigger than f2. So among the three numbers, f0, f1, and f2, the number of edges is the biggest. Um, it cannot be much bigger. It's slightly smaller than the sum of the other two. But there's also another relation between f0 and f2. None of them can be larger than twice the other. So f0 cannot be larger than 2 times f2, and f2 cannot be larger than 2 times f0. Uh, sum enough. For three-dimensional polytopes, these three numbers are each of them bounded by any other of them times a constant, the constant being two or three. In dimension four and higher, this is not true. In dimension four, it is easy to construct polytopes with arbitrarily many vertices and to have a complete graph. All the pairs of vertices are joined by edges, so that the number of edges grows quadratically with the number of vertices, and you don't have this kind of image. And in particular, well, it's an, uh, it's an open question whether still 
um, well, the, the number of edges can be big compared to the number of vertices, but can be big compared to both the number of vertices and the number of three-dimensional pips. This is what this inequality is asking, or, or vice versa. The number of two-dimensional faces can be big compared to the number of three-dimensional faces, but can it be big uh, um, compared to both of them? We don't know. Anyway, so let's move. Let me let me define precisely what I mean by faces and the meter and graph. Uh, if you have a polyhedron and a hyperplane that doesn't cut it but touches uh, your polyhedron, the intersection of the hyperplane to a polyhedron is what we call a face. Okay. And then this phase is just a single point. Uh, so it's a phase of dimension zero, and we call it a vertex. Phases of dimension one are called edges. Phases of dimension d minus one, where d is the dimension of my uh, polytope or polyhedron, are called facets. Okay. And these are the ones that appear in the first conjecture. And then every polyhedron has a graph formed by its vertices and edges. And as in any graph, we call distance between two vertices the shortest length, the shortest path of it, the length of the shortest path of edges between them. Uh, for example, here I can find this path of length two between these two vertices, and there's no path of length one, meaning that the distance is two. And we call diameter the maximum distance between vertices, which in this case is also two. And then we can read again this, this conjecture of this. For every polyhedron with n facets and the dimension, the diameter should not be greater than n. That's what the conjecture says. So um, the main point of this talk is uh, showing to you an example to this conjecture. But let me now say plainly that even um, yeah, these counterexamples uh, they uh, violate the conjecture by a small amount. They violate the conjecture by about 5%, or in the amount that case, by 25%, but this is still linear. And we don't even know whether there's a polynomial upper bound for the diameter of the polytope in terms of n and d. So still the gap between the worst polytope that we can construct and the best upper bound that we can prove is huge. This is the bound between something that is still linear and something that is more than polynomial. OK, um, the Hirsch conjecture is from 1957. It was communicated by Hirsch to Georg Danzig, who had recently, or I guess like 10 years before that, um, introduced the simplest method for linear programming, in the sense invented or reinvented linear programming. And he knew that, that the conjecture was true when the number of facets minus the dimension was at most three. Uh, for example, number of facets minus the dimension equals one is the simplest. The only, the only polytope which has one more facet than the dimension is the simplest, and there the diameter is one, which indeed is n minus d. If you go to n minus d equals two, you have a bit more uh, variety of polytopes that you can construct, but it's still easy to the, the conjecture and Hirsch had a proof for n minus d at most three. Then Victor Klee and, and David Walcott in 1967, they did several things in a very nice paper. First, they disproved the Hirsch conjecture. So it's not true. Uh, Seth told you that I did this proof that the Hirsch conjecture for the first time. Well, that's not true. Klee and Wolkamp did that already in 1967. The only thing is that they did it with an unbounded uh, polyhedron. And instead of saying that they had disproved the Hirsch conjecture, they modified the conjecture to apply only to bounded polyhedron. So since 1967, uh, the Hirsch conjecture has been meant as the conjecture uh, for polytopes, not polyhedron. But anyway, this example is very interesting. It has uh, it's, it's quite small, I would say. It has dimension four and only eight facets, and its diameter has to, happens to be flat. And I have to also, I have also to say that my counterexamples are partially inspired by this counterexample of the apple. Then several special cases have been proved. For example, in dimension three, we know that this conjecture to be true. For polytons whose coordinates are all zeros and ones, we know, we know that this conjecture to be true. Um, for polytopes with facets minus dimension at most six, 
versus the three that, that Fish knew, um, we also know the conjecture to be true. And here, well, for n minus d at most five, this was already proved by Kilian Walcott in this paper of 1967. For n minus d equals six, this is a recent result, um, around 2008 perhaps, and the proof involves some computer um, exploration, some, some computer case study. Then, yeah, in, in 2012, I found the first one of the samples. Uh, and more precisely, I found polyfills of dimension 40, or constructed polyfills of dimension 43 with 86 facets and whose diameter is greater than 40. There are several things I want to mention here. One is don't be scared. I didn't really uh, went to 43 dimensions and construct my polyfills. And, and I'm going to explain here how do you construct something in dimension 43 without going to dimension 43. Uh, to make a long, a long story short, uh, the short answer is that instead of going to dimension 43, I went to dimension 5, I constructed something in dimension 5, and then I uh, sort of, um, yeah, blew it up to dimension 43 in a sense. The other thing, the other two things I want to mention about this result here, or about this sentence, is that 86 equals 2 times 43, that's not a coincidence, that's part of the construction. My construction would always give uh, polytopes with twice as many facets as vertices. But also, it is known since this paper of Klian Wolkup that that is actually the critical case. So another thing that Klian Wolkup proved, and I'm going to mention it later, is that if you know that his conjecture to be true for all polytopes with 2D facets, then it is true for all polytopes, no matter how many passes they have. And vice versa. If you, if you know the Higgs conjecture to be false for those type of polytopes, then it's always false. And finally, I want to mention that here, I'm not telling you what the diameter of this polytope is. The reason is that I don't know. <laughs> okay, this polytope uh, is too big to be constructed explicitly. Um, it should have about a trillion vertices, <laughs> and nobody has been able to construct it. And in particular, I don't have a proof of this diameter. I can only prove that the diameter is bigger than 43, but nothing more than that. Uh, I will also want to say, and I will mention it later, that there's more recent examples um, that I found with two authors, Christoph Bible and Benjamin Maschke, in which this number here is not 43, it's 20, which means this number is 40, and there the polytope is not that big. It only has about 50,000 vertices, but 50,000 is something you can deal with with modern computers. And in particular, for those polytopes, we have been able to compute the diameter, and it's 21. It's one more than the fish. Okay, and as I already said, all non counter samples have a diameter actually only a small fraction, a small. Uh, uh, constant times the huge one. Uh, this is there's going to be 1.05 if you want your your polyhedra to your yeah your polyhedra to be bounded and 1.25 if you allow for unbounded ones. Actually, this 1.25 comes from dividing this five and uh, to this two four five over four, and this 1.05 is 21 divided by 20, which is the diameter of this other example. Uh, Later divided by this dimension. Or by it's n minus three. So um, why was uh, I told you that that Hirsch uh, mentioned this conjecture to Danzig in connection to the simplex method and linear programming? Well, uh, the connection between between these two things is obviously that the feasibility region of a linear program is a polyhedron. And vice versa. All polyhedra are these are feasibility regions of linear program, and and these two parameters, number of facets and dimension, are nothing but the um, numbers of rows and columns of this matrix A in your linear program. The dimension is going to be your, the number of variables, and the diameter and the number of facets is going to be related. I mean, there may be some redundant inequalities, but if you don't have redundant inequalities, your number of facets is exactly. Um, the number of equations of inequalities that you have. And also, because of convexity, if you want to, 
do linear programming, which means uh, find the maximum of a linear functional of this feasibility on this polyhedron, the optimal value is always attained at the vertex. And one way of finding it is just move along the graph of the polytope, uh, trying to increase always your linear functional until you cannot do that anymore. And when you get the local optimum, convexity implies that you have a global optimum also. And that's called the simplest method. The simplest method solves linear programs by starting at any feasible vertex and then moving along the graph in a more long fashion until the global optimum is obtained. And in particular, uh, this huge question, what is the maximum diameter of polyhedra with a given dimension and number of facets, is relevant to understanding the complexity of the simplest method. And in the next three or four slides, I'm going to tell you what is known about this thing here, complexity of the simplex method. Um, the simplex method is not known to be polynomial, or depending who you ask, the simplex method is actually known to be not polynomial, with uh, most of the pivot rules that have been proposed. So in the simplex method, you're going to move along the graph, and you have choices. When you're at this vertex, you look at all the neighboring vertices where your functional has a better value, and you can choose one of them. Uh, the, the, the way you choose is called the pivot rule for the simplest method, and you can choose different pivot rules. You can choose, for example, the edge along which your functional has a um, largest gradient, which would be Danzig's original rule, or you can choose the vertex where your functional has the largest value, or you can choose a random edge along all the possibilities, or you can do many other things. So there's many, many different pivot rules that you can use. All of them will get to the optimum, and all of them will give you a simple method, yes. So polynomial with respect to which? Uh, with respect to the input size, and the input size is basically n and d, uh, this matrix n and d. But this is a good question, because depending on your model of computations, you may or may not also take into account the bit complexity of the entries of A. Right? The, the, models, I mean, the, the, the most uh, common uh, model for complexity is the bit model, in which you will count the bit complexity of all your entries. So the input size would be basically n times d times the bit length of your entries. But there's another models, um, like the real RAM model that uh, Stevens may have pushed about in the 80s and 90s, where you assume each of the numbers here to have complexity 1. You don't care about the size. And you only count arithmetic operations between them. That's, that's called the arithmetic model, or um, a slight variation of it is called the real round model. Anyway, um, in any of these models, for the simplex method to be polynomial, you would first need to have a polynomial upper bound for the diameter, because the diameter is the number of edges that you need to cross. Right? So, so in particular, it is known that with most of the people rules that have been proposed, the simplex method is not polynomial. For example, uh, the first example in this respect was the so-called clean minty cube. It's a cube, it's this cube that you see in blue here, in which uh, the Faces have been slight, slanted, they're not, they're, they're not parallel, it's not a Cartesian product of segments. They have slanted in such a way that you have a monotone path. If your uh, functional is the vertical direction that you want to optimize, you have a monotone path that goes through all the vertices. So in particular, if you apply the simplex method to this polytope, and if you're not very lucky with your pivot rule, you will have an exponential running time because you will go through all the vertices, and the number of vertices in the cube is 2 to the d. Right. Um, it's not only that, that this Hamiltonian path is monotone, it's that Klee and Minty actually worked out explicit coordinates, explicit uh, ways of, of slanting the, the facets, so that Danzig's original pivot rule, the one that uh, goes through the edge of, of the biggest uh, slope, will actually go through all the and after that, the same thing has been done for, for many for many rules. Okay, for this random edge rule, for I mean, this. without exaggerating, I can I can tell you that there's at least twenty different pivot rules that are known not to be polynomial. 
and probably more than I'm not going to expect on that. There's a whole lot of people looking at people. There was, maybe it's not that, that uh, fashionable anymore. Anyway, uh, in contrast, uh, you all probably know that, since that linear programming can be done in polynomial terms. Since, since about 1980, we have at least two, what is an I missing here, ellipsoid, and the ellipsoid method and the integer point methods, which allow us to do linear programming in polynomial time in the bit model, in the model where you take into account uh, the bit size of, of the matrix. But still, and this is a relatively recent uh, site by uh, Michael Todd, the simplex method is, well, maybe not the only method of choice, but at least one of the methods of choice competitive with, uh, and in some classes of problems superior to the more modern approaches. And the reason for that is that typically in practice, what, what practitioners uh, find out is that the number of steps that the simplex method takes to solve the problem with and, and, and equalities and variables is always linear in the number of variables or, or inequalities. Um, and in particular, in the year 2000, uh, there was a list, um, there was a journal in, in, um, in computational engineering that uh, issued or asked some people to make a list of the 10 algorithms that had had the greatest influence in science and engineering in the 20th century, and the simplest method was one of them. And I want to remark that it was not linear programming, it was the simplest method that was chosen as one of these 10 algorithms, even if by then we had polynomial time algorithms for linear programming available. And also, even if you only if are interested in the complexity theory point of view and not in, in performance, um, the sim, um, these, these integer point methods and ellipsoid methods, they're not strongly polynomial, while a simplex method with a polynomial trivial rule would be strongly polynomial. And strongly polynomial means it's related to this difference between um, bit complexity and arithmetic complexity. A strongly polynomial algorithm is one that is polynomial in both the bit uh, complexity method and the arithmetic uh, sorry, model and the arithmetic model. So, summing up, we know how to do linear programming in polynomial time, but the algorithms, this, this integer point method algorithm and this ellipsoid method algorithm, they're both sort of approximation algorithms. So they will get you to a better and better and better point, feasible point, and they guarantee to be close enough to the to the optimum so that, well, depending on, on what approximation you need, at some point you can declare your solution to be the optimum. And, and there are bounds on how many steps you need in order to be available to declare without ambiguity your solution to be the optimum. And these bounds are polynomial. But they're polynomials that obviously depend on the size of the input, because, because otherwise it doesn't make sense to, I mean, it depends on, on whether, um, how should I explain this? I mean, if, if, if you don't take, you want to approximate certain rational numbers more and more, and how bad your rational numbers are must depend on the size of the input. It cannot only depend on the combinatorics of your problem. That's, that's why these methods are not strongly polynomials or both. While the simplest method, if, if you find a, a polynomial pivot root, it will be strongly polynomial. And this question, whether there is a strongly polynomial time algorithm for linear programming, is one of the questions that Steven Smale included in his list of mathematical problems for the 21st century in the year. Okay. So that's, that's the motivation and background for, for studying the Fisk conjecture and studying the meters of polygons. I have also to say that well, um, the path between theory and practice is long. If you prove a polynomial upper bound for the diameter of every polytope, you would not have solved this question. Because this question is about an algorithm. It's not about an upper bound for the diameter. So you need, first you need to know that the diameter is polynomial, but then you also need to find a natural way of finding the polynomial path in polynomial time. Which is, um, anyway, in this sense, more important than the original Hughes conjecture would be this polynomial version of it. Is there an exponent, a constant exponent k, such that the maximum diameter among all polyhedra of a given dimension and 
number of assets is bounded by n to the k. I'm not including d here because, well, in every polyhedron or in every sensible polyhedron, n is going to be bigger than d. So n is the you can think of the complexity of the polyhedron as being just the number of facets. Okay, what do we know? We know these two bounds. This first bound was proved in 1992 by Kalayan and Kleitman, and they call it quasi polynomial. Um, it's a bound of type n to the logarithm of the dimension. So if you agree with me that the logarithm of a number is a quasi-constant, then yes, it's a quasi-polynomial. <laughs> and this other bound, uh, it's worse or, be or better than this one, depending who you ask. Um, it's, uh, it's exponential in the dimension, but it's linear in the number of facets. So in fixed dimension, it's a linear bound in fixed dimension, but it is exponential if you let the dimension grow. Um, okay, so now I'm going to start to slowly get into more geometric and technical things. Let's see how far we get. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is that there's two reductions that were known basically since the 1960s about the piece perfection. The first reduction is that it was known that this maximum diameter is always attained at a simple polyhedron. Simple polyhedron. Um, so, a simple polyhedron, um, P is simple, means, can you see there, or is it too high for the people? If, um, Every vertex lies in the facets. Or if you want, um, the facet hyperplanes, the hyperplanes that define facets, are generic. You have generic hyperplanes, no more than d of them will meet at a point, and in particular, no vertex will be contained in more than d facets. Um, there's a definition. Um, at some point during the talk, I'm going to apply duality, and duality changes a simple polyhedra to simplician polyhedra, which are polyhedra in which every facet has d vertex vertices or equivalently every proper phase is a simplex. Or equivalently, these are uh, polytos whose vertices are in general positions and so forth. These are generic from the point of view of vertices. Um, why is this interesting? Well, um, simplicial polytopes are much more easy to understand from the combinatorial point of view. Their, their, their boundaries are just simplicial complexes, and simplicial complexes are very basic objects in, in geometric combinatorics, which suggests a more combinatorial approach to questions like the piece conjecture. Um, you're going to translate the, the question of Hirsch from simple polytos to simplicial ones. Translate means that, well, now instead of looking at the graph and looking at paths, instead of looking at paths in the graph of my simple polytope, what I have is a simplicial complex. And I'm looking at paths in the dual graph. Looking at ways from jumping from a simplex to a adjacent one and see how far can I get or what's the distance that I need in order to get from one to the other. And I'm going to do this at some point in the talk, which is why I want to have that picture there. Okay, the other reduction is this, this inequality. 
that I mentioned already, in a sense, that the, the maximum, if you fix the difference between um, dimension and number of facets, so if you keep n minus d fixed, then the maximum diameter is always going to be attained when the number of facets is exactly twice the dimension for every element. Which means that the only case, if you want, the only case you want you need to study is that one. Or if you want as a corollary, this is also saying that there's a certain function f with a single parameter k, which I define as being the maximum diameter among k dimensional polytons with two k facets. And then you always have that this diameter function is bounded above by f of n minus d. So in a sense, n minus d is not the correct bound but it is still the correct parameter in which you can measure the diameter of any body. Okay. Now we come to the second part of the talk. Um, and I'm going to describe a little bit this, this uh, counterexample that I constructed in, in 2012. And there, there are two ingredients in them. I'm going to state and give you a hint of the proof or what I call the strong D-step theorem for spindles and prismatoids that I have to define. And then I'm going to show you or tell you that there exists a certain prismatoid of dimension 5 and which has width 6 and together with this theorem that would imply what we want. Okay. So as a warm-up, let me go back to this, this, this theorem here. This is what I call the D-step theorem. I call it the D-step theorem because, well, when the number of facets is 2D, n minus D equals D, and then the his conjecture is telling you that you can go from every vertex to any vertex in D steps. D equals n minus D. Um, and that theorem actually was proved by Clea and Volker via this lemma. They prove that if you give me a polytope or polyhedron actually, of a certain dimension and with a certain number of facets and with a certain diameter delta, then I can increase the dimension and the number of facets by one and keep in the same diameter. Okay. So if you give me a polytope with 13 facets and dimension four, I can increase 13 and four by one until this difference that is nine becomes the dimension and I will get uh, a polytope with dimension eight 9 and 18 facets, and the diameter of the original one is going to be at most the diameter of the final one because of this construction. Um, and what's the, the strong distance theorem that I proved? Well, is this slight modification of it. If you give me a spindle, which is a particular class of polytopes, with a certain number of facets and a certain length, which is uh, analogous to the diameter, but um, uh, device, uh, sorry, um, specialized to spindles, then I can construct a spindle with one more dimension and one more facet, and I can increase the length by one. So this plus one here is actually the only reason why I call my theorem strong this step theorem. It is stronger because I'm, I'm able to increase the diameter rather than keep it. But it is actually weaker also in the sense that it applies only to a particular class of, of polytopes, but that's okay. That, uh, we, will, we will see that that's okay. So what is a spindle? A spindle is this type of polytope. It's a polytope with two special vertices that contain all the facets. So if you want, a spindle is the intersection of two columns coming from two vertices U and D. Um, well, since I have these two special vertices, I'm not going to be interested in the diameter. I'm not going to be interested in the distance between any pair of vertices. I'm going to be particularly interested in the distance between two, these two vertices, and I call that the length of the spindle. Exercise. Spindles of dimension 3 have length at most 3. Uh, proof. Well, if you look at the graph of a spindle, there's going to be some edges that come up from U, there's going to be some edges that come down from B, and the rest of the edges are going to form a cycle, like the equator, if you want. And of course, in this cycle, I must have vertices that are neighbors of B, and I must have vertices that are neighbors of U, 
and in particular along the cycle I must have an edge connected a neighbor of V to a neighbor of U and that's it. That proves that my that my that meter is at most V. Okay, now I'm going to apply this trick. I'm going to go from the simple uh, case to the simplicial case. I mean, it's not that people spindles mean to be need to be simple, but I tend to think of them as being simple, except at the two special vertices. Uh, so I'm going to give you the dual definition of spindle, and that's what I call a prismatoid. The prismatoid is a polytope that has two parallel facets containing all vertices, which is the same as saying that it's the dual of a spindle. And Without loss of generality, I can think of these two parallel facets as being parallel because I can do a projective transformation to my polytope. So this is my prismatoid, and I'm going to call width of the prismatoid the distance in the dual graph between this facet, between this facet and this facet. So the width is the number of steps that I need in order to go from here to the bottom facet, and in this case, of course, it's going to be three. I can go from here to there, from here to there, and then from here to the bottom facet. Um, yeah, three-dimensional prismatoids have with three. Uh, this is a second exercise, and you can prove it in two ways. You can say, well, this is the same question that you asked before, so the answer <laughs> must be the same. Or, or you can try to prove it again. Let's do the, let's do the latter. And um, we want to look at the distance between facets. And in particular, we notice soon that if I don't consider these two facets, all the combinatorics of this of the prismatoid is contained in this intermediate uh, part. All the facets, and actually all the faces that are not contained in this facet or that facet, will intersect any intermediate hardware plane. And if I want to understand the combinatorics of the whole prismatoid, I only need to look at, at the intermediate slides. And in this intermediate slides, I will have again a cycle of, of facets, and, and I can do the same proof as and this is the this is the strong this step theorem in the prismatoid version. If you give me a prismatoid of a certain dimension with more than two D vertices, now I've, I've dualized, I'm looking at the number of vertices rather than facets, and of a certain width, then I can give you back another prismatoid in which the dimension, the number of vertices, and the width have all been increased by one. Um, corollary. If your initial prismatoid has width larger than the dimension, then I can do this n minus 2d times, and I will convert this n to, a, to n minus 2d. I will convert this d to an n minus d, and I will convert this delta to a delta plus n minus 2d, which happens to be greater than n minus d, because delta is greater than d. So if you give me a prismatoid whose width is larger than the dimension, I can apply this, this theorem n minus 2d times and get a counterexample to the Fish conjecture. That's, that's half of the proof of, of the counterexamples of the Fish conjecture. Um, so, from now on, we're going to look at prismatoids and we want to find or understand how to construct prismatoids in which the width is larger than the dimension. Uh, oh. There's a sketch of proof of this code, of this, of this theorem. Let me give you the sketch of proof of this theorem. It's, it's just this picture. Uh, let's see if it works. This is my original prismatoid. These are the two special facets. I call them Q mate, Q minus, and Q plus. Um, in Q plus, you see these additional blue dots. You have to think of them as vertices. Of course, they're not vertices in this figure, but that's, that's a... Uh, there's a defect in the figure. Um, I want to have that defect because one of my assumptions is that the number of vertices is greater than two times the dimension. Of course, that cannot happen in a two-dimensional prismatoid. The two-dimensional prismatoid is a quadrilateral, but it can happen in a, in a, a large, uh, higher dimensional prismatoid. It happens in a three-dimensional prism, for example. Okay, so to convey this thing that I have more than 2D vertices, I'm adding these uh, blue points here, or I could add some blue points there. In particular, because of this condition, I know that at least one of these two facets, maybe both, but at least one of them is not a simplex. And let's assume that Q plus is not a simplex. 
steps, which is why I have this additional points there. Then I'm going to do two things. This first thing, this first operation is called the vertex flip. I'm going to choose a vertex V in the facet that I don't care much about, the one that may or may not be a simplex. And I'm going to do a vertex split. I'm going to change the vertex V, which was there, to two vertices U and W, so that V, the, the old V, is the midpoint of U and W. And I'm increasing the dimension by one. So I have my polytope Q here in dimension D. I have my vertex V here, and I'm splitting V in two, adding one dimension, so that yeah, my former polytope is the intersection of these with the middle hyperplane. So far. This is called a vertex split. And what does the vertex split do to the diameter? Well, here I had the property that the distance between this facet and that facet was at least delta. I claim, I'm not going to prove it, but I claim that that sort of that is sort of preserved here, except that now what are my facets? So this facet Q minus is still a facet here. I have this new facet that I call Q tilde minus which is nothing but a, best, a vertex split of Q minus. Q plus is not a facet anymore, it is a ridge. Is it, a facet? it is a facet of all dimension two. So Q plus lies in two different facets. And my claim is that this operation preserves the width in the following sense. If, since I needed delta steps to go from here to there in Q, I will need delta steps to go from any one of these two facets to the facet Q delta minus. Probably not easy to see the first time you see a vertex split, but it's a very elementary property of vertex splits that was actually known uh, for Cle This is actually how Klee and Wolka prove, prove their, their distance theorem. So, so this first part is nothing but repeating the proof by Klee and Wolka. But then I'm going to do something else. Because this facet is not a simplex, I can create a new facet here. I can move a little bit these points up or down arbitrarily, randomly if you want, and this will create a new facet there. So now I have a now I have a prismatoid. I have a, a, a polytope with two facets that contain all vertices. And what happened to the width? Well what happened to the width is that I will still need these delta steps <laughs> in order to go from any of the facets adjacent to the new one to Q delta minus. But I will need one extra step to go from Q delta plus, Q tilde plus, to any of these facets that I can. And this is the plus one that I want. So, yeah. So summing up, this plus one that I have here, this plus one that I have here, comes from this perturbation, or from this creation of a new facet. And that's a proof. So, to disprove that his conjecture, we only need to find a prismatoid of dimension D and with larger than, that's the conclusion. Uh, and the good thing is that now the number of vertices and facets is irrelevant. I mean, in a sense, it was also irrelevant in, in the original his conjecture. But in the original his conjecture, the diameter bound that you wanted to prove increased with the number of facets. Here, if I maintain my dimension fix, if I look at prismatoids of dimension 5, I only need to find a prismatoid of dimension 5 and of width larger than 5. And I don't care about the number of vertices that it has. That's, that's not important. It will, well, the number of vertices will affect the final dimension of my polytope, but it will not affect the fact that my polytope, by the way, is a huge projection. Uh, well, these things do not exist in dimension 3. They do not exist in dimension 4, and they do exist in dimension 6. So this is, this is, uh, this is my original paper with the counterexamples. This is a paper that was written later, but was published more or less at the same time, or even earlier, together with Damon Stephen and Hugh Thomas, where we proved that in dimension four this could have been impossible. And indeed, there's a big difference between dimension four and five. In dimension four, all four-dimensional prismatoids have with four. In dimension five, you can find prismatoids with arbitrarily large width. Oh, sorry. You can find prismatoids with a very large width, and you can find them with only 25 minutes. So, I was... yeah. Anyway, so how do you construct these prismatoids of width at least six? I'm going to give you also a sketch of not really how you construct them, but how you analyze them. 
So I told you already that if you want to understand the combinatorics of a, say, five-dimensional prismatoid, you only need to look at these intermediate ones. And that's very, very good, because now you have a four-dimensional polytope, and four dimensions is so much better, so much simpler than five dimensions. If, if we only could go down to, one, to three dimensions, then we could use our, our geometric intuition. But going from five to four is already a big step. Now, this intermediate slice is actually not any polytope. Uh, it's basically the Minkowski sum of these two facets that you have, or the Minkowski average, to be more precise. Um, and then, you also know, if you know anything about polytope theory, that in order to understand the combinatorics of a polytope, you can look at the normal factor. It's the same combinatorics, right? So, I only need to understand the combinatorics of this Minkowski sum of two four-dimensional polytopes. And it turns out that the uh, normal fan of a Minkowski sum is the common superposition of the two normal fans of the summons. So the only thing I need to do is understand how these two normal fans of these two four-dimensional polytopes intersect one another in R to the four. But this is also a huge step here, because here I have a question in affine four-dimensional geometry. Now this is a question in linear four-dimensional geometry. And linear four-dimensional geometry um, is the same as three-dimensional geometry if you intersect your normal fan with a sphere. So to make a long story short, with these tricks, you can understand five-dimensional prismatoids by, by looking at certain things on three-dimensional spheres. And there you have your, your geometric intuition. Another question is, should I give more details about this, or should I move to other things? you got about three minutes left. Yes. Oh, yeah. three minutes left. Then let me move to other things. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, this is a picture of how I construct these, these three-dimensional objects. Uh, it's based on the fact that you can nicely embed the torus in a three-sphere, and then these blue and red diagrams sort of represent the two normal fans of my polytos, and I need to understand how they intersect, and yeah, there's some tricky details there. Uh, this, is, this is the original prismatoid. It has 48 vertices, if you count uh, the pluses and minuses. Um, this is the smaller one. This is the 20-dimensional 20, 20 prismatoid with its actual coordinates. So this is a, this is a picture of a non hirsch polytope. Uh, you can see that there's five coordinates here, which are sort of random. These are the five coordinates of the initial uh, prismatoid. And the rest of, of the matrix, which has a lot of zeros and some um, <coughs> triangular blocks is the part that comes from it, from this uh, explosion of one dimension at a time. Um, yeah, let me skip this. How should I finish? Well, let me let me let me state at least these two theorems, and that may be the end of the talk. So you may ask, how far can we go? We have these examples of polytons that that violate the his conjecture by one unit. Can we do better? Yes. If I take partition products of polytopes that violate the his conjecture by one unit, I will get polytopes that violate the his conjecture by more than one unit. Because Cartesian product preserves the number of, well, Cartesian product is additive with respect to number of facets, to dimension, and to diameter. Right? And in particular, if I take Cartesian product of k copies of this 20 dimensional polytope of diameter 21, I will get polytopes with 40k facets, dimension 20k, and diameter 21k, which means I will get this 0 0.05 excess with respect to the Hirsch uh, bound. I can even do something better. So this, this construction increases the dimension. If you want me to keep the dimension fixed, I can, there's, there's a way of gluing several copies of a non fish polytope to one another, and the result that you will get will, will be something like this. So I first take the Cartesian product of k copies of my non fish polytope, so I get a polytope in dimension 20k with a certain with, with an excess of 0 0.05, and once I'm in dimension 20k, I'm going to glue to one another, keeping the same dimension, many copies of my non fish polytope, 
and the result is that you can get polypers with this excess. So the excess can be arbitrarily close to 5%. It's always going to be slightly smaller than 5%, uh, but, but that's it. Now, perhaps in the one minute that I have left, let me tell you what's next. So, we know that the Higgs conjecture is false. Uh, we would love to be able to prove a polynomial upper bound. Many people have tried, and in particular, there was a big effort some years ago to try to prove this. This conjecture that the diameter of every normal simplicial complex, whatever that is, but it includes all simplicial manifolds, and in particular all simplicial polytopes. Uh, the diameter of every normal simplicial complex of dimension d with vertices, or dimension d minus 1 with vertices, is bounded by d times n. This is the current, I would say, analog of the Higgs conjecture that people think might be true, and some people uh, are trying or were trying to prove a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's not true. I think we have time for one or two quick questions. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I missed something at the end, but so is this conjecture known for polynomial? Oh, no, no. For polytos, we do not know an upper bound, of a polynomial upper bound for polytos. So what is behind the scenes here, let me show you this, this uh, all, all the slide. This theorem here is telling you that these two bounds that we know for polytopes that I showed at the beginning, the quasi-polynomial one and the one that is linear in fixed dimension, we actually, the proofs are very simple, and they're so simple that they apply to all these normal complexes, and in particular they apply to all uh, manifolds. But this, but this is the best we can do. So the, all that we can prove for polytopes, we can also prove for these normal uh, simplicial complexes. And that's why people well, are trying to, maybe instead of thinking of polytones, which have a certain geometry that may be distracting, try to think more combinatorially into these normal simulation complexes and, and see what happens there. One more quick question, That happened to 43. Sorry? Never explain 43 and 86. Oh, 43. 43 comes from these 48. <laughs> <laughs> this initial prismatoid that I constructed happens to have 48 vertices. That's my n, and my d is 5, so n minus d is 43. It's, it's just a number of vertices. And then when you find these other prismatoids, or, or when we found these other prismatoids uh, with 25 vertices, now n minus d is 20, so this, this gives rise to the 20 dimensional of non previous construction. Okay, let's talk again.